Hello, all, and welcome to UNLV Libraries Gaming Research Colloquia. Our speaker today is Dr. Martin Harris. Dr. Harris's academic career in research has spanned restoration in 18th century British literature, popular culture, film, and poker, which is, I guess, the culmination of all those other subjects. For the last dozen years, he's worked as a writer and editor, reporting on poker tournaments throughout the world. His newly published book, Poker and Pop Culture, a comprehensive study of poker's history with a special emphasis on the role the game has played in American popular culture will be the focus of his talk today. Poker and popular culture, telling the story of America's favorite card game. Martin. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, today, what I'm going to do is basically present to you this book that I've written um, and ha that has just been published. So I'm not presenting kind of a project that's in process, but it's actually finished. And it came out last week, and I've got it to hold up and point to on the, on the slide there. Um, and it's a project that is actually it's been something I've, w I've worked on for many years, and so it's kind of a very satisfying moment as far as that goes. Um, but today what I want to do is present the book to you, essentially, and tell you what it's about, um, and also talk about how I use the special collections, because a big part of kind of the last latter stage of working on the book was um, getting the Eating Edington Fellowship and being able to come in and take advantage of the special collections. and. Um, that has been a great experience, and I wanted to share that in particular uh, as well today. But there's the cover of the book, Poker and Pop Culture. Um, the book is, and they, so now that the book is out, I'm, I'm very uh, cognizant of these, uh, you know, you're supposed to promote your book and talk about it. So I have the elevator speech, you know, that you can say in 10 seconds or 20 seconds. And I say the book is a history of poker, um, and if we're, moving up more than just a floor or two, then I'll say it's a history of poker, but it's also, and this is kind of, I think what makes the book more unique and the project, it's a history of poker as it's been presented in American popular culture. And so basically you can think of it, it's sort of two histories in one. It's a, a history of how the game has been played, but also how the game has been portrayed in films and music and television and literature and all these other places. Um, and so that is easy enough, I guess, maybe to sort of uh, think about. Um, you can kind of think about that as well as there's, I, there's me trying to write the true history of poker to chronicle this story of this game that began in the early 19th century in America and the 200 years that followed, um, the true history. But then also stories about poker that include stories that aren't true, that have been made up uh, and presented in fiction and films and, and popular culture, generally speaking, and all these other places. Um, that might, again, seem sort of simple enough. There's those sort of two tracks, those two histories, but there's a lot of overlap between truth and fiction when it comes to the story of poker, and so much that it's, it's almost impossible to sort of tell the difference in a lot of uh, uh, situations. Um, I have... Um, there, this is just sort of a, a few pictures of, of, I should stay in front of the mic, a few pictures um, of various topics that come up in this book. Um, and just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, how truth and fiction kind of get mixed up when it comes to poker and telling its story. Up in the upper left is Wild Bill Hickok, who obviously plays a role in this story. Um, and the, that's actually a sort of a detail from a painting uh, called Wild Bill Hickok at Cards by N.C. Wyeth. He, and he painted it in 1916, about 40 years after he was killed in that poker game where he was holding aces and eights, the dead man's hand. Um, and so it is this painter who was trying to imagine uh, what Wild Bill Hickok was like and, and presented this scene of him at a poker table pulling his gun. And it sort of goes along with a story that's told about Wild Bill Hickok, where he was in a game. And he, he was known, obviously, as a lawman and, and for other things, but also as a poker player. And his reputation as a poker player also included him maybe cheating now and then or not playing a square game. But of course, a lot of poker players in the 19th century didn't 
play a square game. So that didn't make him too unusual. Um, but he, uh, in this story, he's at a showdown playing five card draw and his opponent turns over a full house, jacks full, um, and then he, Hickok, announces his hand and says he has aces full. He has a full house, aces full of sixes, and turns over his hand. Um, but he only has three aces and one six. And so the opponent says, where's the other six? And that's when he pulls out his gun and he says, here's the other six, right? Um, great story. Um, is it true? Who knows? <laughs> Um, but it's one of those stories that gets told over and over again about Hickok, and a painting like that kind of recalls it as well. Um, and even during his life, Hickok was this uh, nationally known figure. Um, there was a famous uh, profile of him in Harper's New Monthly Magazine in 1867, um, where he, the famous gunslinger lawman Hickok was profiled uh, by this writer, George Ward Nichols. And it's full of all, I mean, it's a great article, but it's, you know, Nichols claims actually more than once how Hickok has killed hundreds of men, and he says it over and over again. And it's definitely not true that he killed hundreds of men, but this was part of the way that he was presented. Um, and so Hickok, there's a great line in the article where Hickok is, um, uh, at, the end of, at the end of the meeting with Hickok, Nichols asks him if it's okay if he tells his story, if he writes this article, and he publishes it to the, to the world, and Hickok says yes, and his line is, I'm sort of public property. Um, he already sort of realizes that at that point, that he's kind of hit the story of who he is, uh, goes beyond the reality, and that the public is doing what they're gonna do uh, with his story, and that includes his being a lawman and, and also his poker playing. Um, but anyway, that's just one example of many. And so at practically every point in this sort of study that I did, at every uh, point in trying to present these histories, um, I'm dealing with that sort of situation where the truth and the fiction, they get mixed together. And really, if you think about it, it's kind of appropriate for a game like poker, which I don't know if you play poker, but it is a game that is full of deception and that in every hand that is played, there are players trying to conceal the truth from one another um, and present ver the version of the story of what hand they have in such a way that's gonna prove most profitable to them. Um, and so really from, at every sort of step of the way when it comes to poker, there's all kinds of, there's what's really happening and then there's what appears to happen. And so there's something almost appropriate about um, the history of poker presenting this kind of problem. Um, in the book, though, I try as well as I can to talk about uh, poker, the, this true story of poker, and also connect it with America, the place where it was introduced, and show and, and highlight the ways that the game reflects American values and ideas that are associated with America. Um, and that includes things that are sometimes thought of in a positive way, um, these values, a lot of them have to do with like entrepreneurship and ideas of independence and freedom and liberty and self-reliance and how the game kind of exemplifies that uh, in different ways. But there's also um, lots of other significances that poker has had where it gets associated with morally questionable activities like gambling, generally speaking, or drinking or drawing guns on one another and things like that. Um, and so I try to sort of emphasize that as I tell that true history. And then as I talk about how the game has been presented in books and movies and in popular culture, I'm also showing how those portrayals of the game, they comment on poker. They give an idea of what poker signifies to America, what it means. Um, and a lot of times they will, uh, those portrayals will um, romanticize the game, they'll kind of highlight this outlaw cachet that poker has and its associations with all of these interesting characters um, throughout history and, and how poker can be connected with things that are dangerous and that it can be maybe detrimental to individuals or society in general. Um, all of that gets mixed together in these sort of two histories that I present in the book, the history of poker and the history of the way poker has been portrayed uh, in popular culture. And so as I worked on this project, 
I'm obviously someone who is pro poker. I'm, you know, positive about poker. I like to play it and I like to read about it and think about it. Um, and this, all of that informed writing a book like this. Um, but in the book, I try to be as objective as I can about all of this and be a historian as well as I can without necessarily, I'm not in there kind of being a cheerleader for poker in the book. I'm trying to present kind of how the game, uh, especially in the way the game has been portrayed in popular culture, there's a lot about it that um, re it reflects upon America, but in both good and bad ways. And so, you know, there's a lot of, in fact, I kind of begin the book with a big list of sort of negative portrayals of poker. Uh, and then go back and go back through the story that way. Um, but there's this, the great quote, you may have heard it before, um, from Walter Matthau, who was in The Odd Couple and playing poker, and that's one of the, the movies that I talk about in this book. Walter Matthau has this great uh, quote about poker where he says, the game exemplifies the worst aspects of capitalism that has made this country so great. And it's a great, I, I, you, you better know, I talk about that line in this book and kind of try to unpack that a little bit. This is the paradox about, you know, it's, it's this wonderful game that presents all the bad things about um, America. Um, I wanted to talk about, like I said, I want to talk about the, how I use the collections. Um, uh, first, let me, and I should hold on to this, let me, uh, I want to talk uh, like I said, I want to talk about how I use the collections. Actually, let me show you this slide here. It's an action shot of the scholar uh, in the collections uh, reading Poker Jim there, a novel. Um, I want to talk about how I use the collections, but I also wanted to, and in fact, let me first sort of tell you about the organization of the book. And for that, I've just got a list of the chapters here that I want to show you. So. Um, this was a challenge, and it changed a lot as I was working on the project. But I finally settled on this organization, and I think I, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. The book is broadly chronological, and so if you read the book at the beginning, um, the early chapters, and you can kind of get an idea from the titles there. I'm telling you kind of how poker was, uh, it, it came to be. The precursor games, the other card games that were played in Europe and then brought over, and elements of those games were put together and became poker in the early 19th century. And then you get the first references to poker in print, and then all of these uh, other sort of uh, 19th century examples of poker that I talk about. And then towards the end of the book, it moves much closer to the present, and I'm talking about online poker and the 21st century and kind of how the game has evolved. And so the, the book is chronological, Although, I realize, in fact, I didn't even realize this until very recently. The book had already been done and was you know, being printed and everything. And I realized that th what I did with this sort of, you know, th these chapter titles that all kind of resemble one another, that I created or I tried to sort of present kind of a geography of the game, geography of poker, that talks about all of these places where poker has existed and exists. And then places I'm using literally, but also figuratively. Uh, and so you can see sort of in the chapter titles that there's these places that are literal locations like on and along the Mississippi River on the steamboats and in saloons in the Old West um, and in encampments in the Civil War, the soldiers playing and all these literal places like clubs and saloons or clubs and casinos and uh, the home, which is actually kind of a very important location for the game uh, as well. And then sort of figurative places like media, like m poker in the movies, places where you find poker or you encounter poker, um, television and music and, and so on. Uh, and then also p places, and I kind of wanted to make sure to include all of this in the story, places where um, poker kind of comes up in, as a meaningful analogy you know, such as business, so poker in the boardroom, um, in uh, politics, the president's playing poker in the White House, uh, and war and military and so forth. So all of these kind of places. Um, and so that's kind of how the book is organized. And I wanted to, like I say, basically talk about how I use the collections. When I got here, I had already had essentially this organization in place, and I had a lot written. Um, and a lot of notes 
but I had ideas about how I was going to use the collections um, to kind of add to what I've done, what I'd done. And I ended up finding a lot more uh, than I anticipated. Um, and I've, I've kind of put in bold chapters where I've definitely used the collections materials, although there's other places in the book too, but I just wanted to kind of quickly go through these as a way to wrap it up and tell you um, uh, sort of how I use the collections. And, and then we can, you can ask, if you have any questions, we can talk about them. Um, if you go onto the, the online catalog and you type in poker, there's about 1,300 items show up. Uh, most of them are books, but there's lots of journals and uh, media and pictures and all kinds of fun stuff that you can uh, uh, get that has to do with poker. Um, in that early chapter of poker in print, I was uh, hunting down and, and presenting the first references to poker in books and, and first published references in the 1830s. Um, and it's in that chapter where I'm talking about the uh, American Hoyle, the Hoyle's Games uh, editions of the book that came out in America where poker first comes up. And I drove the uh, student assistants crazy, uh, sending them back over and over again into the stacks to find me more editions of Hoyle's Games uh, and so I could find when the first time that this was mentioned and so forth all the way through, talking about the first references to poker. The first one's in 1845 um, in Hoyle's. And then uh, the earliest reference in print is 1832, actually. Uh, and then in, in a book, it's 1836. But in any case, um, that came in, into that chapter. And then in the, the poker on the bookshelf chapter, that one is primarily about strategy books. And so the, whole, the chapter gives you kind of a mini sort of, uh, you know, com compiles a mini history of, of poker strategy books, going back to the first ones. And the collections are great for this because they have all of them. Um, and so I was able to kind of put my hands on them and, and look through them and share uh, with my reader uh, what these books covered. And the, for me, kind of the most interesting thing, the way this fit into the larger project of the novel was the way that these strategy books reflected attitudes towards poker. Um, and what I mean is you would have in the earliest ones, and I'm talking about like the 1870s, 1880s, where you get these book length uh, studies of poker, um, there's an acknowledgment of how of poker's very negative reputation. Um, and so all kinds of apologies from the authors for even writing a book about poker and strategy um, and, and disclaimers about the game, warning readers away from the game altogether, which seems like a funny thing to do if you're writing a book about poker like this. There's, and a lot of them would publish them anonymously, and so they'd have, uh, you know, instead of, they'd have pseudonyms, or there's one of them that was published where the writer just signed it, one of its victims, <laughs> as, to get the point across that poker's dangerous. But you get that sort of impression, and, and so I tried to present that in that chapter. Um, and that changes over time. You get into the 20th century and especially later, um, and you see um, less of that kind of qualification going on and, and more sort of uh, the assumption being that it's okay to, to talk about poker strategy and to talk about poker being different from other gambling games uh, in that way where you can actually, there's a skill component and you can actually improve and, and have a better chance to win. But that's uh, poker on the bookshelf. And like I say, the collections were great for that. Um, poker in the boardroom, that was, I, you know, there was books in the collections. This was one of those things I didn't anticipate looking at when I came, um, but ended up uh, finding these books, uh, interviewing uh, these uh, people from Wall Street who were poker players and, or who would talk about poker as they talked about their business strategies and investment strategies. And there, too, actually, there would be some uh, trepidation about talking about poker sometimes from some of these uh, you know, in hedge fund managers and people who didn't want, a few of them didn't want to sort of make what they did seem like gambling. And so the comparison with poker, they were a little bit shy about, right? Because people think of gambling when they think of poker. And so, but others were more comfortable with that. But I'm talking about Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and people like that in that chapter. Um, the poker and casinos chapter, obviously the collections have a lot about the history of casinos. And I was able to draw upon some of the promotional material from the early casinos where they would talk about the games that were being offered in the casinos. And maybe poker would be there, maybe not. And really kind of the argument of that chapter becomes how 
poker isn't that huge a part of the casino, um, really, the whole way, <laughs> like all the way through uh, the 20th century and even today, it's kind of a relatively small part um, of the operations of the casino, even though, you know, you talk to sort of poker players, they might think about it differently, but um, there was a lot in the collections that helped there. Poker on the newsstand is a chapter about poker uh, in as it has been reported on and talked about in magazines, um, and mostly non-poker magazines. I'm talking about like mainstream magazines, news magazines, and entertainment, and that sort. And of course, from those references to poker, you get a, an idea about how uh, the game is thought of and its significance in the country. Um, I did talk about some poker magazines too, and so the collections have the 1896 magazine Poker Chips, uh, probably the first poker publication, poker magazine, and so I was able to kind of look at those and, and talk about them in that chapter. Poker in the movies, um, the collections include, they have some great uh, old scripts from movies, so I got an old early draft as a Cincinnati kid and, in, and examined it closely to see if maybe Lancey and Lady Fingers had cheated on that last hand somehow. Uh, there was no evidence in the script of that. <laughs> um, but great sort of, you know, you see all these differences when you look at these early versions of the scripts. Um, they have the early draft of the California split as well. Um, and one of the great, there's a, I talked to a few people for the book and one of my sort of, uh, sort of favorite parts of the book is the fact that I got to talk to and get to know Joseph Walsh, who is the screenwriter for California Split. Um, and so I, he comes into the book in a few places, including in that chapter where I talked to him about that movie. Um, and the first draft of that script is unbelievable. It's like it's so well put together and includes a lot of things that aren't in the movie. But And the sting, there's the screenplay for the sting. And so working out that, that hand where how did he have the four jacks? How did he turn over um, the hand? How did uh, Gondorf cheat in that hand? But in, in any case, uh, that helped me in that chapter. Poker and literature, you saw the picture of me reading Poker Jim. And there was other novels, uh, a lot of things from the 19th century and early 20th century that I had not been familiar with. I was familiar with a lot of things, but um, I was introduced to, thanks to my time in the collections. Uh, poker on television, I just wanted to mention real quickly, I had, uh, I found they had a script of, um, it was a screenplay from a 1950 television show, The Billy Rose Show, a live performance, a half hour show that centered around a seven card stud game. And there was all this great uh, commentary on the game from uh, the producers uh, and the difficulties that they faced trying to film this card game. And it's this, this plot really sort of centers on the playing of a seven card stud hand with like six or seven players. And you have to know all of their up cards and everything. And so, the, and they had to film this live in 1950 um, and so they had to sort of figure out how to move the cameras and sh show you the cards and, you know, there's cheating and they, all of this was very important. So that was a fun way to sort of begin that chapter, actually, on, of, about poker on television, which talks about uh, fictional poker on television, sitcoms and dramas and so forth, but also real poker, the WSOP and the ESPN coverage and so on. And so um, they faced the same challenges when showing poker later, more recently. Uh, and then Poker on the Computer was a chapter that I originally thought would be all about online poker. And I think spending time in the collections helped me sort of shape it a little differently and talk about actually efforts to create poker playing programs with computers going back to the, really to the late 50s and early 60s, uh, and then video poker, uh, and then online poker. And so the collections have a lot of great uh, things to go with that. So I wanted to just kind of share that and, and also thank the, uh, the Center for Gaming Research and everyone uh, who works with it for helping so much because I think it added so much to the book and helped me uh, sort of flesh out these things and make me th help me think about sort of the topic that I was writing about uh, in different and more fruitful ways. And so that was uh, what I wanted to, uh, and a thing that I wanted to share with you. So any questions or anything about the, Chapters, should I put the chapters back up, maybe? I'm going to give you a mic, because uh, I'm listening. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll <interpret. laughs>
Hey, Martin. Um, is the history of the chip a subtopic of the history of poker, or is it completely separate? Well, it, it is definitely part of the story, um, and there's the great sort of observations about whoever invented the chip was, was a genius because of the way it disassociates the value of, of the money that you're, you're, you're betting with in, in the games. That's not something that I actually talk about too much uh, in the book, but it's um, definitely part of the, the I talk about the history of the playing cards and when the chips were introduced and, and Earliest print mentions of poker, you mentioned early 19th century. What form of poker or forms of poker were the oldest ones that they started? Was it five card stud? Was it draw? What did they? Yeah, these first references actually, and it's pretty consistent back in the 1830s, they were to a game that's actually a 20 card game. So you could only have four players and you would deal out five cards to each and then you'd bet on them. And it was it gets referred to kind of retrospectively as straight poker. Um, and then the draw is only introduced later. And then the use of a 52 card pack is, is or the whole deck only comes a little bit later. Uh, and then the, the additional betting round after the draw. And so you start out with straight poker, then you go to draw poker. Stud poker comes later, um, after the Civil War, really. And that's another example of sort of, there's competing stories, some true, some made up. Um, and then, of course, Homa. Uh, Omaha and Hold'em and so forth is much later. Um, I thought it was really fascinating because I just started reading it um, that they started out playing with 20 cards because now this short deck exactly. is becoming so popular. And you mentioned that with the 20 cards, it was way easier to cheat, which also ties into the early history. So that made me think also about short deck and whether just the fewer cards makes it easier to cheat because more improbable things could happen. Is that why? Well, I think it's the limited number of cards. So like if you mark a card, it, it has more as one of 20 rather than one of 52, it potentially has more importance that way. Um, and so, yeah, these guys uh, who are writing about poker and warning against it, um, they, they talk about this, they call it a short game and they're referring to it as a short deck. Um, and so it's um, definitely, I think an increased likelihood Right, that totally makes sense. Yeah, something to think about as short deck becomes so popular. Also, I wanted to ask, like, um, what were you most surprised by in your research here? Um, and was there like a specific book that you recommend to learn even more about some of these historical things? Um, it, well, there were certain books. It's interesting because I've been asked that bef before about sort of are there other uh, books like this one or that I drew on. And obviously, James McManus's uh, Cowboys Full, which was published about 10 years ago, was a book that I was very conscious of as I wrote this one. Um, and I talked with McManus, and you know, we, we were, we were, I was wanting to uh, present something different from what he did. And I think the emphasis on pop culture is kind of the, the big diversion uh, from his book. But it, his is valuable. Um, but other books, you know, there's books like uh, At Herbert Asbury's Sucker's Progress, um, which is about gambling, generally speaking. It's a much older book, um, but it has a lot of really valuable, um, really all the important stories about poker are, are in that book. Um, and then there's other, other historians. Uh, Robert K. Diarmont uh, wrote a, a couple of books that were pretty useful to me. And then really, it was these uh, the other sort of sources that I think I drew on the most would be these poker narratives, like Al Alvarez is the biggest game in town, um, Anthony Holden's Big Deal, uh, books like that, um, which were very poker-centric and which also brought in a lot of the history. A lot of times they would sort of signal to me um, areas of poker's history that I then would go explore further uh, and discover other things about and use other authors to kind of fill in my knowledge. But. That's fantastic. I mean, one of the things that struck me from just reading the, the first third of the book is how much we have to overcome as poker was literally synonymous with cheating. When do you think that, it, it, uh, it probably comes up later in the book, when do you think that poker is not really any longer synonymous with cheating or has that conflated in with it? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, it's, it's hard to say exactly. I, I feel like in, throughout the 19th century and well into the 20th century, you know, by mid, you know, in past mid-century, um, poker is 
you know, cheating and poker are, are kind of, uh, they go together and they're thought of uh, very similarly. And that legacy, along with other sort of associations with the Old West and violence and, and all these other sort of morally questionable things, um, becomes this legacy that hangs over the game and still affects the way people talk about poker. Um, I think, you know, you get into, uh, as the casinos, as poker in casinos and clubs develops, and you have uh, sort of efforts to regulate the game and the eye in the sky and, and so forth and it, and in the 60s and the 70s. Um, and then, you know, where a casino can, cannot get a license to spread poker without assuring that the game is square, uh, that's when you start to see that change, I think. Um, but really, it, and it, you, you see people write about poker being played in the 70s and the 80s and 90s, and they're still talking about cheating and being wary of it. Um, and so it's probably not in, uh, until you know, the last couple of decades, you know, since the boom, the poker boom in the, the 2000s, um, that uh, you can start to, it, where it becomes disassociated with cheating. Um, I'd be interested to hear you speculate about where we're headed. So could you talk a little bit about the last chapter, Poker in the Future? Yeah, that's a sort of a bold uh, title for our last chapter, right? And it's sort of meant to get people turning the pages all the way to the end. What is, what's that, what's, what happens next? Um, and what I do in that final chapter is I talk a little bit about I, I kind of, uh, I don't want to give away the ending, I guess, exactly, but, uh, but I do talk about how the game is going to prosper despite the continued, um, you know, efforts to prohibit it. Um, the chapter right before the last chapter is called Poker Under Siege and tells the story of online poker in the United States, and which is largely under siege right now. It's uh, thanks to... Uh, uh, various laws and, and prohibitions against um, online gambling. Um, it's starting to come back. Online gambling is starting to, we're seeing that in many states, uh, legislation being passed. Um, but uh, that chapter is basically describing how online poker had its moment uh, for from the late 1990s to the early 2010s uh, and has kind of gone away, maybe to come back someday. And so in the last chapter of Poker in the Future, I talk about how what the game is going to be like. The game is always going to exist. It's always going to continue probably to be popular in America. Um, what lawmakers do is going to affect it, um, obviously, going forward. Probably the economy has more to do with it than anything, sort of how a game like poker is going to thrive or not, um, as long as people have money to to spend on a game like that. A game that requires money as one of its essential elements. Um, it, the, how the economy does is gonna have a lot to do with, with what's gonna happen next. Um, and I talk also about poker. I talk about essentially uh, poker having become this export to the rest, from America to the rest of the world, uh, where the game is thriving uh, uh, incredibly and growing at a fast clip. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm talking about. I don't have any kind of real specific like, uh, you know, science fiction story to tell you, but about poker in the future. Can I ask you a question to sort of back from the future to its origins? I'm fascinated how a card game actually is initially developed, as you said, based on a number of older card games, European card games. Where and how in the United States was it developed? Was it in one place? And how did it spread and develop from there? Well, very likely the game, you know, we had this sort of mix of people from different places in the southern part of the country and in New Orleans especially. Um, and so all of these European games, uh, like Bragg in England and uh, Moose in Spain and Polk in Germany, and probably the most important precursor was this game, Polk, P-O-Q-U-E in France. Um, where you had settlers from those places uh, bringing those games, um, and then elements from each kind of were, were taken uh, and become poker. And there's the speculation that poke is being mispronounced as poker. Uh, and so New Orleans is a good candidate for that. There's obviously a lot of um, uncertainty 
about making that claim, but talking about the 1800s, 1810s, the first couple of decades of the century, um, there, are, there aren't references to it, but you see, after the fact, references to the game being played in New Orleans and then getting on the steamboats and going up the Mississippi and then out through the tributaries. And, and so that's the first way it got spread. Thank you. Other than, is it pure historical accident that poker is an American game, or do you think there's some connection between American culture, American um, demographics? Is there, is there some reason poker was invented and popularized in the US as opposed to somewhere else? That's a, that's a good question. I think, I mean, there's obviously sort of accidents of history that helped contribute to it uh, coming and, and being introduced. Um, I think that although probably even in that, when we, when we talk about that, there, there's the fact that these people came to America wasn't an accident. There was reasons why they did. Um, but then the game's growth, I think, definitely is associated with uh, American, the ideas of the frontier spirit and this entrepreneurial uh, urge that Americans have, um, that early Americans, that it, it, it's the way that the country is described uh, during the 19th century, um, helped foster the game and helped promote it and encouraged its development and spread. And I don't, and that probably isn't an accident. Um, that the game, you know, which, and and I'm, I'm I've been sort of saying it in a very quick and general way, but you know, making all these pronouncements about the game reflecting American values in order not to bore you with long, a long lecture about that, but. Um, I think that uh, those things are important, and those are the reasons why the fact that the game does reflect kind of ideas of independence and you know the self-reliance and, and so forth that you can argue that, and even the American dream, as people sometimes style it, um, is why the game uh, became an American game, uh, especially. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much, Martin. That was thank you. Thank you all for coming.